I am Duango AC, Keeper of TaskBot, and I am so happy to welcome you to the Ocarina of Time Data Showcase. Our director with us here today is Soren. Hi, everyone. I'm a tools developer and music arranger for the N64 community. We also have Save State. Hello, I'm an Ocarina of Time scientist, speedrunner, and world record holder. We only have a couple of quick things to tell you about really fast. This is an unmodified Ocarina of Time cartridge. This is the first release we know of that came out in the United States, and you wouldn't believe what's in this cartridge. This is a real, original N64. The only modification is an RGB mod to get a clean video signal. Otherwise, the console hasn't been modified in any way, and the gameplay is completely unaffected. And what we'll be showing you today is some beta and debug content from Ocarina of Time, including content left on the game cartridge. In order to bring this content to life in the game, we'll be using arbitrary code execution, which we'll explain in a moment. And in order to make that possible, we actually have to work with both a human speedrunner, save state, as well as TaskBot here. And we'll introduce TaskBot also in a moment. But we're going to get started with save state. Yeah, so if we're ready to start, we'll begin in three, two, one. So the game has a pretty long intro sequence, so we'll explain more of what's going on uh, while that's happening. So first of all, I need to introduce the version one of TaskBot. He is brand new at this event in his new form, and I'm so excited to unveil him. If you've never heard of TaskBot before, he is very fascinating. He pretends to be a controller connected to a real console, and he presses buttons extremely fast and extremely precisely, faster than any human ever could. Now, there's a couple of quick things we need to talk about, because this run is kind of unique. Most of the time, when you think about a speed run, you're talking about a human speedrunner, like Safe State here, doing a run from start to finish as fast as they can with human effort. And we call that an RTA run, or a real-time attack. In the case of TaskBot, he's usually playing back tool-assisted speedruns, or a TAS. Usually a TAS is uh, made ahead of time with a lot of, of engineering challenge effort put into it. And what you're going to see here today is fascinating because we can't do just a TAS in Ocarina of Time for a number of technical reasons. We'll always end up with a desync. So instead, right now we're having save state play. They'll play through to about, about a few minutes in. And then at a certain point, we'll connect TaskBot to all four controller ports. TaskBot will press a series of button presses very quickly to achieve what we call ACE. More on that in a second. And we'll get to a point where we'll pass control back to save state. They'll continue playing on controller one, while TaskBot will continue to be connected to ports two through four. Then a lot of interesting things are going to happen. You're going to enjoy this. Now, there's a couple of things we need to talk about, about ACE and SRM. ACE stands for arbitrary code execution, and SRM is stale reference manipulation. I'll let Soren talk about a little bit more about uh, SRM in a sec, but just to give you an idea of what ACE is. In the context of a computer, you would consider ACE when an attacker or someone who's not the owner of a system somehow gets code or gets data on a system that looks like code to execute. In the case of a game, typically ACE happens when a talented gamer finds a glitch, is able to get data in a system in a certain way, and then convinces the game system to execute that as code. This is used in certain things like the Nintendo 64 80% of Ocarina of Time, which uses an H ACE to write a couple of instructions that end up jumping to the end credits. So there's a lot of interesting things you can do. Once you have arbitrary code execution, you can do a lot of different things. But you have to get there first, and that's going to take some SRM. I will, I will let Soren describe what SRM is here. Yeah, so SRM stands for Stale Reference Manipulation. And it's basically a glitch or an exploit um, that has one main glitch and a bunch of sort of supporting glitches um, that allows us to achieve arbitrary code execution. Um, so SRM is, is sort of the process, and arbitrary code execution ACE is the, is the result. And um, to understand SRM, um, it's in, a, in a computing context, you might, uh, might hear of this be called uh, use after free. So we're using some resource and memory after it has theoretically already been freed. Um, and so to understand how that works, I, I first want to explain uh, somewhat how, about how the game's memory works. So in memory, there is a region of memory called the actor heap. Um, and actors are, let's say, Link or a rock or an enemy or anything like that that has some sort of behavior in the game. And so when you go through a loading zone into a near, new area, like right now, uh, the game will load all of the code and all of the data for all the actors in the new area you're going to be in into the actor heap. And uh, you know it'll load them in an order depending on what was there previously. 
And uh, normally, you don't care what order the contents are in the actor heap because the game keeps track of where everything is. So it doesn't really matter where, where everything is. Um, but what we're, we're going to do, be doing is we're going to be manipulating the actor heap so that where one item is in memory ends up coinciding where something else loads later. Um, and normally, that, again, that wouldn't matter, but because of some other glitches, that will matter. And I'll explain that in a moment. So the way we manipulate the heap is, let's say if you pick up a rupee or you throw a rock or something like that, that item will be removed from the actor heap, and then something else could load there later. So if you go through another loading zone, then that means how everything else loads will be shifted around. Um, and so you'll see us like collecting seemingly random rupees and uh, you know going going through a loading zone over and over, and that's basically shuffling around the data in in the actor heap so that we can have this particular alignment of particular data to each other later. And what those two pieces of data that we're going to align is, one of them is the uh, entity, basically the, the, the temporary actor data for a rock uh, that Link is, is going to be holding. And then what we get to load in there in place of it is the code for another, another actor, which is this wonder item. It's, a, it's a, basically an invisible rupee that you can collect. And so, that, might, that might not make sense at the moment, but I'll explain why we need those two to align in memory. So the other piece, the actual stale reference of stale reference manipulation, is that uh, we, use, we use some glitches to cause uh, an object to unload that Link is holding. And so you know, what this means is Link, Link grabs a rock, and on every frame uh, that Link is you know, holding the rock or whatever, any item that he's holding, uh, the game uh, updates the uh, position and rotation of the rock so that it appears over his head because you know he's moving around it needs to con continuously update where the, where the rock is and so the way that works is that link's actor has a pointer to the rock's actor and uh, every frame link's actor will overwrite the position and rotation of the rock and so using a bunch of glitches we're going to lock the camera and then have link walk through a loading zone at the same time that the, the rock unloads and uh, the result of that is that the rock will unload from memory, but Link won't update his pointer. So he'll still be carrying the now nothing, this unused memory. And every frame, Link will be, Link's code will be overwriting the position and rotation of now nothing, uh, this unused memory. And then we get the uh, code for the wonder item to load into that same slot of unused memory. Um, and then that means Link co Link's code, every frame, is now overwriting part of the code for the wonder item. So it's not it's not uh, you know actor data but actual code and then if we get the game to execute that code by you know normally uh, having actually having the wonder item on screen it'll execute that code it'll run into those instructions that we overwrote and then it'll run that instruction and that is instructions that we you know as as a player because we can set what that rotation value is uh, we set up that value and then we can execute that code that we wrote and uh, with this technique we only get to control two bytes of one instruction. Uh, which is enough to change the uh, target of a branch instruction, which will basically have the game uh, jump to another place, execution jump to another place in, in memory. And that other place is going to be Link's rotation. Um, so it's, you know, Link's rotation, two shorts, uh, Link's sword rotation and current rotation, or something like that. And uh, that also encodes an instruction. We're going to use that to encode a jump instruction that will jump to some memory that is holding the current state of all of the controllers. So. That, that is just you know memory holding all of the buttons and, and control sticks. And so that's where we'll switch to Taskbot. So Taskbot will input uh, controller input that is uh, that uh, it will be you know interpreted by the game as normal controller input, but will also be interpreted by the game as code. So just to go over this this path again, we're talking about uh, code execution normally goes through the wonder item. We overwrote an instruction from uh, holding this rock and uh, that will then jump to Link's rotation, and then Link's rotation will jump to the controllers, and then we'll be executing controller input as code. Um, and then Taskbot will take over and do some interesting things with that. So we're just uh, you know finishing this setup here. Got to do a few glitches here to uh, lock the camera. So the camera is locked and sort of in a strange state now. I'm gonna go over and uh, change the angle of the camera and get the camera locked into a different place. Ah! 
Now we're going to pick up this rock and make the camera switch at the same time. <laughs> now we have to walk off screen holding the rock and uh, manage to let, navigate out of the loading zone holding the rock without any visual reference. So just take a moment here. And so now you'll see we're holding nothing. So Link is updating this unused memory. Now that we've crossed back over a loading zone, that memory is filled in with this, uh, the code for the wonder item. And uh, when we put down the rock, that's the last time we've updated that uh, rotation value, which is now overwriting part of the code. And now we have to set up Link's rotation. So you know, if you were really lucky, you could just push the control stick and make Link rotate it in an exact direction. But you know, we, we have to use a setup for this. So uh, this is we're, we're doing basically a, a series of maneuvers that will each move Link's angle by a certain amount in a certain direction. And so we do this series of maneuvers, and it will uh, you know result in Link having an exact value for the rotation, uh, which will encode this uh, jump instruction. So almost ready for task bot here. We just have to have, we're buffering a, a turn. We have to have Link aiming in the exact right location here. I think that's it. Yep. So now I'm going to switch controller one over to TaskBot. So TaskBot is now connected to all four controller ports. Starting TaskBot. And we're going to play a short task movie here, about 20 seconds or so. So right now, the game is you know, interpreting the controller input as Link wiggling around, but also interpreting, interpreting the controller input as code. At first, it's one instruction per frame, and then it goes a bit faster. And after a few seconds here, you'll see a little green bar in the corner of the screen. That means this was successful. That was the big moment, though you may not have realized it. <laughs> and so now we've switched. So we've switched controller one uh, back to task bot, uh, sorry, back to save state. So they will continue playing on controller one for the rest of the run. Uh, but uh, task bot remains connected to controller ports two, three, and four this whole time. And so we just had to go into a house to uh, clear out some residual um, glitches that were active um, with, for the arbitrary code <laughs> execution. So here's our first piece of content to show here. This is the inventory editor. This was created by the developers to you know, be able to test, more easily test the game and you know, set up link state. Uh, we basically just had to write one byte to memory uh, in the pause screen uh, to turn on the inventory editor and be able to use it. So you may have actually seen this in the Majora's Mask feed runs at least at one point. Um, but uh, yeah, so we don't have to go to the dungeons and get the items legitimately. We just give ourselves all the items we're going to need throughout the rest of the run. So this piece brings us to our next piece of content here. This is the R Wing from Star Fox 64. Uh, you may have actually seen this. Sorry, you may have actually seen this at home. Uh, if you have a game shark, you can you can run a couple of game shark codes and get it to spawn. The developers of Ocarina of Time back in 1998 created the R Wing uh, to be able to uh, test physics for the Fire Dragon Volvagia, and it has its own uh, uh, animations and sounds and everything. But we were able to dispatch it with the boomerang pretty easily here. So that brings us to our next piece of content here. So uh, some of you may have played Zelda 1 on the original Nintendo. And on Zelda 1, the Lost Woods was a place that you could go, um, just like here in Ocarina of Time. And it was one screen with room exits north, south, east, and west, just like this first room here in, in Ocarina of Time, in the, in the Lost Woods in Ocarina of Time. And in Zelda 1, you had to learn a code from some uh, NPC or somebody that uh, was north, west, south, west. You had to uh, go through the exits in the woods in the order northwest, southwest. If you did, you would get through the woods successfully. And if you didn't, you would fail and you would get thrown out of the woods. But here, if we go north in the first room in Kokiri and, and Lost Woods, um, we just immediately get thrown out of the woods. Um, and so you would think that that means that this code can't possibly apply to Ocarina of Time. But actually, what we're doing here is we're getting lost out of a north facing exit and then getting lost out of a west facing exit and then out of a south exit and then a west exit. So it's, it's the same code, but it's actually getting lost multiple times. And uh, this is the last one, the west exit here. And so we just have to re-enter the, the, uh, the woods uh, a fifth time. You hear a Zelda chime. That means we've unlocked something. So you know, I'm, it isn't really clear if maybe uh, nobody tried repeatedly getting lost in all these different exits in this pattern, or maybe if they did, that they didn't know where to look next. Uh, because you'll miss him if you don't know where to look. This is a beta Kokiri. 
So this is our next piece of beta content to show here. There's actually several beta Kokiri bodies and a few different beta Kokiri heads left on the cartridge. This is actually, you know, actual beta content left on the cartridge. And so this beta content, this beta Kokiri is uh, looking for uh, some kind of bug, but he doesn't want the bugs that we have in our bottle. He wants some flying bug, something about flowers. So we've got a, you know, this is typical, uh, you know, child Link side quest. We got to find some a bug for a Kokiri. Uh, you know, this is what Link has to go through. So, so. Uh, this brings us to our next piece of beta content here. So in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, you may have noticed butterflies in the games, um, sometimes fluttering over a hidden grotto or over around a torch in Majora's Mask or something like that. And in Ocarina of Time, left on the cartridge, there is a 3D model for a, the get item model for a butterfly. Um, and there is also an entry in one of the item tables for a butterfly in with all of the other vital, bottle items. So it's pretty clear that at some point in development, it was intended that you could catch a butterfly in your bottle. And so, uh, you know, here, uh, this is, you know, the shop normally doesn't have a butterfly in sale. Uh, but since we have talked to the Beto Kohiri and he's looking for a butterfly, we can talk to the shopkeeper and he will now respond to this. And we're going to be try, we're going to try to be quiet so y'all can read the on-screen text. So here's the butterfly 3D model that's left on the cartridge. It's actually ironic. There is a bug in the display list for this butterfly. There's actually an issue with one of the texture formats. So we had to patch that with uh, arbitrary code execution. So now we have to give this butterfly to the beta Kokiri. Uh, fortunately, we have a warp point nearby. So we just have to head to the forest here. And this will be a good time for a couple of donations. Absolutely. The Yeti sends us a breathtaking $10,000 donation. And they say, hey all, Yeti here. You may not know this, but we are pretty good friends with Tazbot. Tazbot is actually Yeti's emergency contact. Yeti has notifications turned on Twitter for Tazbot. Tazbot will be the best bot at the Yeti's wedding. One day, if that ever happens. Anyways, we're all very proud of everyone who donated towards this amazing Tazbot block. You are amazing. Thank you, Yeti. We have a $5 donation from Shaden who says, donation power. Yes, every donation has power. And thank you, Black Turtle, for the $25 donation who says, Tazbot, best bot. Need more Tazbot. Time for one or two more? Nope, nope, we're here. Got it. <laughs> thank you. Um, here we are at the Beta Kokiri again. We're going to give him the butterfly. Seems like Mido is pretty unpopular around these parts. So this magic powder is actually a normal Adult Link uh, trading item, except it's normally called Odd Potion. Um, the magic powder, uh, you know, even though it's pretty clearly some sort of you know powder on a napkin or something like that, um, and. Uh, the magic powder was introduced in uh, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, which is the game right before Ocarina of Time. So I'm not really sure why they translated it as uh, Odd Potion. But anyway, we're gonna, normally this is an adult-only item, but we have it now, and we're going to use it here in the same place that, uh, that Adult Link normally uses it. Excuse me, uses it. And we're just going to say no to some of the dialogue prompts so you can see the alternate outcome. Mido. Not a popular guy around here. No. Nope. So this brings us to our next uh, thing to show here. As many of you may know, in Ocarina of Time, there is a mask trading side quest. Um, the masks don't do too much outside of the side quest. They have a couple of small functions, and they change some dialogue. They don't really have any serious magic powder, uh, magic power. Uh, we just upgraded the Gerudo mask here. And we're going to do the same thing for the bunny hood. Save State has done a, a little uh, uh, inventory manipulation glitch here to uh, uh, allow us to equip two different masks at the same time, which isn't normally possible. 
So we're going to upgrade the bunny hood also. So now our masks are powered up. And I'll explain that more in a moment here. But the bunny hood now will have its behavior from Majora's Mask, allowing us to run very quickly, which will be very helpful here. It is a speed run event yes. after all. So yeah, I'm not sure if you would call this beta content exactly. It was clearly content that was, uh, you know, being thought about by the developers while they were developing Ocarina of Time, the, the uh, you know ability to have these masks and have them uh, have magic powers. Uh, but it was left in Ocarina of Time in this vestigial state of this mask trading side quest, and then expanded into a full, you know, complete new behaviors for all the masks in Majora's Mask. Uh, so we're going to be heading over to uh, Grudo Valley, um, and uh, we have time for a couple more donations. Certainly. Joe Burt donates $250, and they say Metroid Dread Boss Rush sounds dope. Will we hit the incentive? I hope. With Samus and skill, the bosses will kill. Will this speedrun be boring? Nope. <laughs> and thank you one more to, oh wow, thank you everybody, yeah. Nups Nups donates $20. They say, I hope I'm not too late for the Limerick train. No, you're never too late for that train while I'm on the mic. There once was a speedrun event that donated every cent, called SGDQ, broke some records too, and prizes presented by Cent. One more? Uh, no, uh, we're, we're pretty much here. So, uh... Just going to run over to the other side of the bridge here. So normally, uh, there's this Gerudo guarding this gate here. Um, and normally, if you wear the Gerudo mask and you go up to her, she, uh, she says, you've got guts, kid, coming around here wearing something like that. But now that the mask is upgraded, and it's actually magical, she thinks we are a half Hylian, half Gerudo child. And she'll open the gate for us. You can also get over here with speedrunning strategies, but that's not as fun. We're just going to talk to a couple of the guards for some flavor text here. <laughs> Sounds like they have a pretty tough life out here in the desert. Got to make sure they don't see us uh, switch our mask again. We have time for maybe one long or two quick donations here? Yeah, certainly. Wiggly Boots donates $25. They say, Tazbot was a major reason why I started watching GDQ years ago. So great to see Dwango, Tazbot, and the rest of the team still making amazing things happen. I agree. Save State, Soren, Dwango, y'all are incredible. Give it up for them, y'all. And Vega 4K, $10, and says, fantastic run. Less than three. So we're just going to talk to a couple more Gerudos here so you can see more of their backstory. Normally don't get to interact with them as Child Link. I wouldn't want to be them. And here's Naburo, future Sage of Spirit. This is, you know, her home, basically. So it looks like our disguise is working. Oh, maybe not. Sounds like Ganondorf is not popular around here either. So what this is about is 
There's a couple hints in the game code looking at it that perhaps at some point in development, the Spirit Temple was actually intended to be completed by Link going back and forth in time, like within the dungeon, not just doing half of it and then going and pulling the Master Sword and then doing the other half. So if that was the case, uh, Link would need some way to go back and forth in time, uh, you know, without pulling the Master Sword. And Nibiru would need to be able to teach him this ability that he would need. She won't take no for an answer, but that's, you know, pretty common for uh, NPCs in Ocarina of Time. So Nibiru plays the Shanai. This is the instrument that you'll hear in the background music of the Spirit Temple. I'd like to think that the Spirit Temple music is just Nibiru off practicing somewhere in the halls. And I'll talk about this ocarina that you're seeing here in just a moment, uh, after we're done with this, this cutscene. It's a little tricky to input. You can see why Nintendo didn't leave this in the final game. <laughs> So we've learned the song, it represents courage, and it will allow us to change between child and adult without having to pull the Master Sword, and that will be very important. Uh, by the way, we'll just speak to Nibura. She says she'll see us again in a few years. We'll see about that. So yeah, about the ocarina system you saw there. So uh, in the game, normally, uh, if you can play the ocarina, and there are five notes that are used for all the ocarina songs that you can play with five buttons on the controller, but you can also press R and Z to go up and down by half step, and you can press the control stick up or down to go up or down by a whole step. Um, so you can play a, the full song of time like, like you saw here, but it would just will never be detected by the game as an ocarina song because the game has actually two different systems in the code for handling ocarina songs. One is just for the five notes and one is for all of them. So what we did here is I made a couple patches with arbitrary code execution to ma basically make it that it was using, ah, uh, yes, yeah. basically uh, use the system that supports all of the notes for all of the ocarina playback rather than, you know, these two systems sort of half and half for different things. So this brings us to our next thing to show here. This is the running man. You may know him from Ocarina of Time. He has, you know, sort of a late game uh, side quest. You can start this race with him and then uh, he'll give you a head start. You run to the end of the race as fast as you can. You can get on a pony or whatever you want and you get to the end of the race in a bridge in the Lost Woods, and he'll already be there, and he'll say, you know, you did well, but I beat you by one second. And even if you use speedrunning strategies to freeze the timer and end the race with a time of zero, he still says that he beat you by one second, and he's still there. So that means that this running man must be doing some sort of, you know, time manipulation shenanigans in order to be able to beat us all the time. Uh, but now, we have the ability to do some time manipulation shenanigans of our own. So, basically what we've done is we've started the race, and what we're going to do is go back in time seven years by playing the ocarina, go to the end of the race, and then go forward in time seven years, and we will be at the end of the race before the race started. And so hopefully we'll finally be able to beat him. By the way, if you thought of this, you know, many years ago as a possible way and went to, uh, you know, put the Master Sword back in, that will stop the timer. But this will not stop the timer. So you see we have a timer that is corrupted. It is a very large negative number because we are back in time seven years before the beginning of the race. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, trying to draw the number, but it's reading graphics out of, out of bounds. And also, as, uh, as Child Link, we have access to the bunny hood, so we can run more quickly to the end of the race. Oh, that's the uh, Child Link version of the running man. He doesn't know what's coming to him. <laughs> <laughs> so we have time for uh, one long or two short donations here. Sure, how about like five quick ones? We have a $1,000 donation from Tareen with no comment. A $500 donation from Maybe Root with no comment. A $250, a $500, a $500, and a $1,000 donation from Anonymous, 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 and Anonymous with no comment. 
Oh, and a one thousand two hundred thirty-four dollar and fifty-six cent dollar donation from Sam D. Thank you so much. With no comment. All right. So here we are. Here we are at the end of the race. This is the bridge that's the end of the race, and we're just gonna warp back forward in time seven years. You see, you see our timer is still corrupted, but it's actually at negative seven, six, five, and here he comes. And the timer ends on zero. So he's not happy that we finally beat him. So any NPC in an Ocarina of Time, if we complete their challenge or help them out or anything like that, they have to give us a reward. So let's see what the Running Man has for us here. And since we're Adult Link, uh, no, more, no more bunny hood, so we have to use traditional movement techniques, at least traditional for speedrunners. Don't try this at home, kids. So here is our reward from the Running Man. This is a beta item actually left in the cartridge. It's a giant rupee, and this is actually what it does in game, is it blows up. That's actually its behavior. <laughs> so he is not happy about that. But we'll be fine. He's a... Uh, He's so fast that we can't shoot him with arrows. He just runs out of the way. He'll dodge a lot of stuff. We can't avoid, uh, you'll see we got knocked back, but we didn't take damage from that. We can shoot him a couple times when he's uh, getting up there. Also, he's vulnerable to crouch stabs if you hit him at the right timing. He doesn't know how to jump over those. Get a couple hits in there. There we go. Don't worry, even if this uh, safe state will be fine at this, but even if even if we weren't, uh, we still have the inventory editor, we can give us our, ourselves unlimited hearts and everything, so. <laughs> Just need one or two more hits here. Oh my god. <laughs> The arrows don't do a lot of damage. Stabs do a lot more. Oh no. We did cancel the damage from it though. Z targeting him makes things worse, so we're just <laughs> not doing that. I think I need like literally just one more hit now. Yeah. There, there we go. go. There we go. Ooh. Not an easy boss. No, not in, not at all. Very tricky. <laughs> so now we get to see some of the Running Man's backstory, why he was able to beat us all these years. Found some object here. It's dropped by someone fleeing town, I guess, when the castle was attacked. It's a golden locket. Not sure that's how physics works, but uh... it's, not. <laughs> it's a video game. The redemption arc. <laughs> So here we have the Sage's Charm. This has enhanced our magic power. It represents power. You can see it has doubled our magic, magic bar again. And it says, equip the Sage's Offerings. So we'll do that in just a moment after we watch the Running Man run off into the sunset. 
So, yeah. So this, this is another beta feature from Ocarina of Time. This was shown in pre-release uh, screenshots and videos, the ability to equip the medallions. So the original version of Ocarina of Time, uh, the magic spells were the medallions. You would, you would equip them to see and then use them. Um, so, for example, the fire medallion was replaced with that magic spell was converted into Din's fire. But there were all six of them. They all did interesting things. This was also back when there was a wind temple and some other beta stuff. And uh, we have a moment here, but I'm going to let Duango AC shout out the Taskbot community. Yes, indeed. But before I do that, I want to tell you about that shirt again, because it's just that awesome. If you head over to the Yeti, you will see the version one Taskbot shirt. It's, this is our first outing with our new Taskbot form that we've worked on so hard over the last couple of years. He looks really cute on that shirt. I had an update from the Eddie a couple of hours ago. They'd already sold over a thousand of those, and that means that that alone is donating five dollars per shirt for that. So this is for charity, folks. Go out and get them. This is the only time you can get them is at this event. Also, we have the Taskbot community at discord.gg uh, slash Taskbot. And as other quick shout out, the folks before us, they're over at, um, oh gosh, I almost forgot their name. Uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, P2SR, uh, uh, discord.gg slash P2SR. Those folks are not necessarily associated with the Taskbot community, but they had a fantastic task earlier, and I wanted to make sure I gave them a shout out as well. Uh, so again, if you're interested in tool assistant speedrun content being run on real consoles, head on over to discord.gg slash taskbot. So we're just going to head in here to Dor Zora's domain. Before we get in there, I'll mention, so in Ocarina of Time, normally um, when you complete one of the adult link dungeons, uh, you dispel Ganon's curse on the area. So for example, in Kokiri Forest, it was originally covered in, in monsters. And then when you beat the forest temple, all well, the monsters go away. And so for the water temple, the, the water in the lake was lowered. But uh, when you beat the water temple, the water is raised. But the ice in Zori's domain never melts, even though this was Ganondorf's curse. But now that we have the fire medallion on C, we can use the powered up fire and melt the ice in Zori's domain. And this is very important because as child, uh, we can't dive deep enough to get where we're going. And then as adult, you cannot use the iron boots because there's a layer of ice. Not going for that exit. We're actually going for this one down here. This is an alcove you can see, but now it's actually an exit. And it will lead us to the unicorn fountain. So this is a beta area that was shown in pre-release videos and screenshots. It's basically Similar design to uh, unicorn, uh, to the fairy fountains from Majora's Mask, but it has this extra unicorn statue here in the middle. And there's also the uh, pedestal of the ocarina here. This is a real beta item actually left on the cartridge that we just had to spawn in here. And it is used as an ocarina prompt, of course. So this is another beta item. This is a 3D model actually left in the cartridge. This is the Beta Great Fairy. This is the original design for the Great Fairy. Um, we just had to, it was actually in the same object file as the normal Great Fairy. And there's uh, beta pre-release uh, screenshots and videos of the Beta Great Fairy here in the Unicorn Fountain. She's going to teach us a song that represents wisdom. So this song, The Overture of Sages, was actually shown in an early rumor about Ocarina of Time from 1999. It wasn't really clear if this rumor was true or not because, you know, there were some issues with the screenshots. They looked a little bit photoshopped. But, you know, here we are learning The Overture of Sages from the Beta Great Fairy in the Unicorn Fountain. And she tells us here to uh, play the song before the Blade of Destiny. It means the Master Sword, of course. You'll hear that she still has the final version of the sound effects, the laughter, so oh well. And so we're going to do exactly what she told us, which is uh, 
go and play this song in front of the master sword. We have a warp there. And so, you know, it's very important. We were, we were, we were Adult Link, um, but we became Adult Link without ever pulling the Master Sword. And that means that we never opened the Door of Time, we never pulled the Master Sword, Ganondorf never got into the Sacred Realm, and the world isn't destroyed. This is how it looks like normally as Child Link, but we're Adult Link here in this scene. So we gave ourselves the uh, uh, three spiritual stones in the inventory editor at the beginning, so we have them. So we're just going to go and, you know, open the Door of Time sort of like normal, but uh, now as Adult Link. And the full Song of Time has replaced the normal Song of Time in our inventory. That's why we have to play it here. Normally, we just play the normal Song of Time. So this is a normal cutscene, except normally only Child Link can be in this cutscene. And in fact, if you, you can see the spiritual stones clip into Link's head there, because he's taller than he should be. And, uh, in fact, if you use speedrunning strategies, skip the Door of Time, and get into this cutscene as Adult Link normally, the cutscene will play out, but the Door of Time does not open. Um, it, we looked at the code. It looks like it's probably just an oversight on their part, but it would be nice to think that it was a, you know, an anti-cheat measure where you know, if you, you speedrun your way here, you can get your cutscene, but you can't get your door. This is another cutscene that normally only Child Link can be in. And again, we have the big Goron sword on our back and in our inventory. We have never had the Master Sword in our inventory. Master Sword is still here in front of us. We're not going to be pulling the Master Sword. We're going to be playing the Overture of Sages in front of the Master Sword, as the Beta Great Fairy told us. Says warp to the sacred realm. So here we are in the chamber of sages. So we got the full Song of Time, which represented courage. We got the Sage's Charm, which represented power. And we got the Overture of Sages, which represents wisdom. So our heart is now in balance between the three virtues. And so you'll notice these side platforms here in the Chamber of Sages. These are actually in the, in the scene normally. You'll see them in the, in the cutscenes. But normally, we don't get control in this scene. And normally, we certainly don't get bridges that will lead us to the side platforms. So the sages are each giving us their blessing and creating these bridges that allow us to climb higher in the sacred realm. That's what they call love at first sight. <laughs> so Nuburu said that uh, she'd see us again in a few years. So here we are.
So the Sage's Charm did indeed belong to Impa. She dropped it when she was fleeing the castle. So those are the six Sages. And there's one more platform up here. Sounds like Sheik maybe has some idea of what we're up to here. I think we all want to know the answer to that question. Before we go through this door, I just want to remind all of you, for everyone who's just joining us, that this is an original, unmodified copy of Ocarina of Time. And this is a real, original N64. We haven't modified anything about the game in advance. All we've done is press buttons on four controllers very quickly and very precisely with the help of TaskBot. So this really is vanilla Ocarina of Time, just with a lot of glitches and a lot of very careful building on those glitches to create everything you're seeing here. Folks, folks, enjoy. So as you may have guessed by now, this run actually is not called Ocarina of Time Beta Showcase. The true name of this run is Triforce Percent, because this is how to actually get the Triforce in Ocarina of Time. Yeah. But that isn't quite the end of the run. We have a bit more to show you today. Please take a look at this. So what do you think we should wish for? Well, King of Hyrule is a lot of responsibility. Yeah, rupees, I gotta tell you, folks, I think you should be giving your rupees to Doctors Without Borders instead. So, shout out to Doctors Without Borders, of course. So what do you think, folks, should we see the future?
By the way, this is in engine. This is not a video. This is the N64. Type here together in the chat. Now is a fantastic time to subscribe. Don't forget, you can gift sub people. If you are subscribed, type here together in the chat, or just try a few emotes that are really popular. Okay. So that is what we can do with arbitrary code execution. <laughs> we really didn't modify anything about the game in advance. We really just pressed buttons on four controllers very quickly with the help of TaskBot and used glitches and built our way up to having more and more control over the game. The specific things we said along the game were beta content actually on the cartridge. That was really true. Those specific things were actually on the cartridge. But everything else, from the plot tying together the beta content to the whole finale sequence, was created by our team and injected into the game live through controller input. When people talk about arbitrary code execution or even just technical speedrunning in general, folks will often say, oh, they destroyed the game. We wanted to do the exact opposite. Instead of being destructive, we wanted to make Ocarina of Time more complete than it ever was before, to make real everything fans wished it would be or believed it might have been, and then to go far beyond that to create something completely brand new that could have never been done in 1998, but still completely with the game, within the game. Over 25 people contributed to Triforce Percent, and it, we've been working on this since a week after the ACE exploit was found in November 2019. It has been such a long journey, but such a rewarding journey to finally get here. But this project goes far beyond us, the developers. We've been fortunate to have the opportunity to partner with some of the best content creators, as well as some of the hypiest reactors, who are creating content about Triforce Percent that will be released in the coming hours and days. You're seeing them on screen here. Please go ahead and check out their channels. I want to give a big shout out to GDQ for lending us their platform and helping us help them raise money for Doctors Without Borders. To Save State, because I'm not actually good enough at the game to do the ACE setup myself to Duango AC for giving me a chance when I first approached him about this in early 2020, and most of all, to the fan community 
whose dreams and dedication to this game are the foundation of this project. The community is the future, so let us create the future together. Thank you all so much for watching. Wow. Wow. That was incredible. That was incredible. Everyone in the room is standing. Standing for Mr. Tazba, Dwayne Gorosi, Soren, and Save State. So incredible. I want to read one last donation. I think this really hits it well. The Sound Defense donates $25. They say, this Ocarina of Time beta showcase may be the most fascinating thing I've ever seen at a GDQ. I can picture a game containing all of this interesting story content, and I want to see more. Thank you to Save State and the Tazbot team for showing this off. Give it up one more time.